In the last few years, we've seen a wave of strikes and walkouts by workers in the education, hospitality, and technological industries. And while unions have declined in uh, participation rates, they are rooted in our history with moments where people stood up to promote an economic democracy. An inspiration today's union members aspire towards with the modern labor movement. Here to discuss how the 2020 candidates plan for the working class fit into our experiences with industrial democracy is Professor of Democracy and Justice Studies at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, Harvey Kay. Welcome, sir. Good morning, Crystal. Let's start with this idea of industrial democracy and how it fits into our history. Well, industrial democracy as an idea or concept in some ways goes back to the labor unionism of the 19th century, but as a specific term really originates with the capital P progressives in the early part of the century, you might say 100 years ago. And th these ideas were involved, well, basically these ideas involved empowering workers in the workplace that you know, progressives were seriously concerned about the future of American democracy in light of the concentration of power and wealth that had prevailed in the, what we call the Gilded Age. And the idea of industrial democracy was to enable workers to band together, organize labor unions, negotiate with their employers, and basically have a say, once again, inside the workplace. That was not an idea that, uh, that employers welcomed. And it, uh, even though unions did advance during World War I, in the 1920s, employers did everything in their power, using both carrots and sticks, to prevent unionization. And in fact, unionism fell back. But the Great Depression really did change the public debate, the public discourse. Um, unemployment was high. Uh, homes were being foreclosed. Farms were being shut down. And we see the, re the emergence of a new kind of Democratic Party led by Franklin Roosevelt, a party that had roots, obviously, in the progressive movement, garnered ideas from the Socialist Party. And Roosevelt himself, when he went out to campaign in 1932, spoke very affirmatively, really strongly in terms of workers' rights and the imperative of workers themselves to fight for their rights, but also the imperative of the Democratic Party to, to recognize, appreciate, and defend those rights. So and when we... How did yeah. that transform the experience for workers in their workplace? I mean, now we sort of assume that, you know, industrial jobs, factory jobs are good paying, are good middle class jobs, but that wasn't always the case. No, I mean, consider the fact that, that what we think of today as the benefits of a good job being not only a decent wage, but also good benefits, neither one of those were guaranteed. And one of the things that the Great Depression made very evident, and this is fundamental to Roosevelt and the Democratic Party and the whole New Deal idea was to find a way to raise workers' purchasing power. Because the economy, as Roosevelt and the New Dealers saw it, was able to produce, but they weren't, workers weren't able to buy. They weren't able to consume. So the idea of unionism, as, as the New Dealers saw it, was to enable workers to stand up to, in the workplace and say, we need more. OK, that's first of all. The other thing important about it is, is that that progressive tradition the capital P progressive tradition, which was really important to, to FDR, really did see the imperative of giving workers a right to band together in the workplace. So it's that. And then the third thing, which is really important, is Roosevelt came to appreciate by, by way of his, you know, his conversations and otherwise with John Lewis, the head of the uh, mine workers, with Sidney Hillman, the head of the American uh, clothing workers, that it was really imperative for, for labor to be able to organize in order to bring about the changes that the New Deal required. So for example, ultimately Social Security, Fair Labor Standards Act. So it was both an inside the workplace kind of question, industrial democracy, but also empowering workers together to stand up to corporate bosses, to corporate interests. Now, Republicans have been uh, attacking unions for decades now. They've been very effective in getting this so-called right to work legislation passed and also through sort of demonizing unions and pitting workers against each other. But how has the Democratic Party done, the historic champion of unions, of labor rights? How has the Democratic Party done in recent years? Well, let's put it this way. We've seen 45 years of class war on the part of, of, of corporate bosses regarding labor. and it's really hard to see the degree that it's hard to call the Democratic Party the, the party of labor, the party of working people, the party of unionism. 
I mean, over and over again, starting with Jimmy Carter, we saw democratic promises and democratic retreats, that is democratic party retreats. And so it, in the 1970s, where perhaps 25% of American workers were, were organized, today we see at best 10% of American workers organized. And we know that along the way, Democrats did have opportunities as both as uh, holding the White House and in dominating Congress. So for example, Bill Clinton in the early 1990s when he became president, he actually turned his back on the very forces that placed him in power, which were not only the environmental movement, but very decidedly the labor movement. And he pushed through the Bush plan, the Bush the father plan of NAFTA. And over and over again, basically, the Clintonites turned their backs on labor. And, and we shouldn't forget that that may very well have led to the reason that you ended up with workers who were no longer unionized, angry, and ready to give the Democratic Party a punch in the nose, quite frankly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, if I could just add, Obama had said that he would march with labor, that he would put on his marching shoes and turn out where labors were, were on strike or where labors were under siege. Now, I have a personal point in this, and that is that I belong to the American Federation of Teachers. I'm a public employee here in the state of Wisconsin. And in 2010, when Scott Walker passed the, well, basically enacted what was called Act 10 and took away collective bargaining rights for public employees, he smashed unionism, took away our rights, and we didn't see anything of the Obama administration coming in to support us or to bolster our campaigns. And let's not, let's not forget, we occupied the state capitol. 100,000 and more people on, you know, regularly were turning out to oppose this Act 10, but we were abandoned by the Democratic Party. And then within the next couple of years, the Republicans in the state passed actually a right to work law. And I would just add, Wisconsin was the first state to enact public employee collective bargaining rights in 1959, and then mm. we lost them in 2011. Yeah, Wisconsin has a long and deep history of, um, of you know, within the labor movement. Harvey, talk about the, the Canada State. I mean, we've seen a lot of activity from workers. We saw a teacher strike, which was one of the biggest worker movements that we've seen, you know, certainly in my yeah. lifetime. We're seeing more and more workplace actions. We're seeing uh, unions at their highest rate of popularity uh, in quite a long time yes. as well. How are the presidential candidates on the Democratic side responding to that energy? Well, we hear a lot of rhetoric from Democratic candidates. The, the candidate who's really stood out in terms of defending and advancing the question of workplace democracy is, of course, Bernie Sanders, though I have every, every expectation that uh, Elizabeth Warren will soon probably issue some kind of similar proposal. And of course, um, Joe Biden thinks of himself as the friend of labor. And on his, you know, the day he announced, he went back to Pennsylvania and had a number of union workers, probably trades workers in particular, standing around him. But it, what's really significant right now, and this was a feeling I had over Labor Day, even as I went to, even as we went to the Labor Day picnic on Monday, is that in spite of the darkness of the day, I mean, the sort of rise of the far right, the you know, Trump's encouragement of that, uh, the assaults on labor after 45 years, you get this feeling that working people are going to start st are standing up once again, and you noted the teacher strikes and others, and. I, I have this feeling that especially when you see someone like Bernie Sanders, who's done so much to bring the Democratic Party to a more small d democratic posture regarding both social democracy and now industrial democracy, that there are real opportunities. So Bernie issued recently a workplace democracy plan, a workplace democracy plan that had serious echoes. I mean, you could really see, especially following his economic bill of rights for the 21st century speech, you could really see the way in which Bernie was reaching back to Franklin Roosevelt and the labor movement of the 1930s and saying, this is the time to enable workers to organize, to enable workers to organize, to fight inequality, to guarantee democracy in America, because unions for all of their faults over the many generations have been the strongest force for democratic change. I mean, the best example in 1963, the March on Washington movement was for jobs and freedom, which was both the civil rights movement and the UAW by way of Walter Ruther, turning out a quarter of a million people. So Bernie is saying, okay, we're going to re-empower workers to organize. We're going to empower workers who in the past have not had guaranteed rights to organize, such as domestic workers and agricultural workers. We're going to end the right to work laws that say that you don't have to join a union if there's a union, and basically you become a free rider. That is the work, 
the, the workplace is such that the unions bargain for you, they get you better benefits, they get you better wages, you don't, you don't join, you don't join in the solidarity, and yet, nevertheless, you get to enjoy the benefits. He also talks about sectoral bargaining, so that inside of, inside of industries, you know, say the paper, paper industry here in Northeast Wisconsin, there would be some kind of boards that would enable fair wages to, to operate across the board of all the, of all the plants. I mean, it's really a dynamic, dynamic proposal. And again, I have every expectation Elizabeth Warren will do that too, which is to say that just as Bernie pulled the Democratic Party to the Democratic left in the wake of two, in the course of 2016, so too I have a feeling that he will lead the way inside the Democratic Party to empower working people all the more effectively, which by the way, can only help both the Democratic Party with a capital D and American democracy with a small right. D. Right. Well, I would call his plan radical, except that it is so in line with our history in America. So well, it's only as radical as we've been in the past. Um, Harvey K., thank you so much. Great to have you. Thank you, Kristen. We'll have more rising right after this.